Mm. All right. I Hello. Think we are running, I think. Welcome. Finally. Yes, we are. Um, welcome to your stress-free guide to navigating your college application season. Unless Starting it comes to technical, technical difficulties. <laughs> which isn't stressful at all. No, no, this, this, this is stress-free. Stress-free. We're, we're getting in the zone. Well, thank you so much to those of you who stayed with us and are here to see our webinar. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and we will take you through our slides. All right. So I'm Carrie Jorgensen. I'm one of the senior college coaches here at ESM. I have a background in working in high schools as a high school counselor. So I, I like to say I know kind of both sides of the desk. And then I also spent two years in undergraduate admissions for the University of California. So I kind of have a, a background from all perspectives and I'm really excited to share some tips and tricks with any attendees here today. And you are, I'd like to introduce yeah, my yeah. partner. <laughs> yep. My name's Eric Carter. I'm also a senior college coach here with ESM, been in and around admissions now, um, coming up on like 15 years. So like a, a long time being around this process. And while it continues to evolve and change, so it's never boring. Um, in the end, we're here to try and help navigate from now. Usually this looks like the next 10 weeks is kind of this really the big application season from now until that November 1st deadline. So overall, there's a lot here, there's a lot to cover, but I think that when you have kind of a checklist of what needs to be done, you can kind of not worry about in case of emergency break glass, you're not there yet. And students can still have a great application season, even if they're starting now. Absolutely, absolutely. You'll have to, you know, hit pedal to the metal, but it's very feasible. So don't freak out if you haven't started anything. Um, and really, we thought that the best way to take you through this um, guide is to just chat through month by month the pieces that are needed to, to get you from A to Z. Absolutely. All right. Well, August, August, it's August now. So we are, we are kind of on the, get on the second half of August. We know the first and most important thing is defining your college list. You need to know where you're applying. I know sometimes that's kind of difficult to think about where maybe you land, if it's a reach, a range, or if it's a likely school. A lot of your big help can be the common data set. Just Google common data set and that school name. It kind of breaks down what the average student that is as being accepted uh, for those schools. And you can kind of see if you're in that spot. If you're kind of below the average student, you're probably reaching. If you're right around where all the other students are, that's 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 a range school. And if you're above what the average student that has been accepted, then you know that it's likely a likely school. So defining that that list and then looking at if it's early action, early decision, regular, kind of those two main rounds. We call them early and regular rounds. In general, those early rounds kind of have a November 1st deadline. Careful, some do have an October 15th deadline, um, but there's only a few of those. And then you kind of have the regular round, which could be kind of December 1st, December 15th, and January 1st. So laying out your college list and when those applications are due can be really, really important. Finalizing the test print plan, seventh semester tests. Yes, sometimes you're taking tests in the middle of a lot of this that's going on, which is why I tell high school students, the next 10 weeks are difficult. You're juggling a lot of different things. We get it. Once you kind of get through, you'll see that you get to go enjoy your senior year, which is a very special year of high school. But the first part of it is pretty tough. You're juggling more than you've ever had to juggle. That's okay. You'll make it through, especially if you just kind of finalize what you need to do in terms of your tests. Are you going test optional? You don't need to worry about it. Are you trying to hit an extra test in September and October? Or um, I think the SAT is coming up here. Um, so it's it's one of those that, which test? Are you taking another test? Are you registered? Or are you gonna be uh, test optional? Because there are schools that uh, are not requiring it. Kind of the first tactical piece after you're defining your list and test our plan is creating your Common App account. That Common App covers the vast majority of schools now especially like schools that were uh, predominantly on coalition app, like UT Austin and University of Washington, both um, are on coalition, are on common app now. So that made a huge difference for a lot of students. So we're seeing that overall, you most students are kind of having that common app, that UC app and that CSU apply app. It's the three main ones. Yes, there's some independent apps that are out there too, 
But overall, most of our schools are now in Common App. So creating that account, starting to fill it out, inviting your counselor, adding colleges, kind of the tactical piece of Common App. I tell kids is overall, give it about 15 minutes a day and you'll be really, really good on your Common App side. Setting up an essay doc, that's really important. A lot of the selective schools uh, have essays, extra essays outside of your personal statement. So kind of get an essay doc that you can write all of your essays in one spot rather than trying to move it around and have different folders and different essays. And we really recommend, and what's what we do as, as essay coaches is put everything on one document, put your activities on one document, put your essays on one document. So you know where everything's at. It also helps if someone is, if you share it with someone to help them edit or help them with your essays, it's all in one document, it's all right there. So it makes it a lot easier. So we say, set up an essay doc and put everything there. Put your prompts there, put the prompts in the UC essays, put the prompts in the personal statements. It really lets you kind of know, this is my main document that I'm working on. It's really easy for others to help and you can share it with them to get feedback and advice. By, by about this time in late August, your personal statement brainstorming and some rough drafts are a really good idea. That rough draft of a personal statement, remember, you're maybe keeping 15 to 20% of that first draft. A lot of it is cut. And so I tell kids, don't worry about how, writing is not about getting it right the first time. It really is an editing process. It's writing out kind of that longer version of kind of getting just out, getting your, your brains out, getting what's on that paper, kind of word vomiting a little bit of just getting on the page and then starting to edit from there. And, and able to get the craft into it as it goes. But at first it's getting those rough drafts, those brainstorming, kind of what you're gonna write about for you. Who is you as a person? Who are you uh, academically? Who are, are you interested? What are you curious about? And how that can translate for college oftentimes makes it a perfect personal statement. And then by the end of the month, you should start to outline those supplements. That's why that college list is so important because now you know what supplements you need to read. Common App is up. You can go into each school, see what other extra essays they might have and put them on your essays doc so you can start outlining those. You're probably not quite writing those in August. You're generally gonna be writing those in September, but having an idea of what you wanna write about and getting used to the different typical types of supplements. Why us essay, like the why NYU or why Chapman, the, the typical activities essay, expand on one of your extracurriculars. Um, or it could be, how are you going to build into the diversity of our campus? That's another very common one. How are you going to make an impact here? Um, so having those outlines will help you kind of see, oh, these are kind of on, on trend. A lot of your UC essays will also be carryovers that you can do a lot of, uh, oh, I wrote an UC essay about this and then carry over to a supplement as well. So August is busy, but a lot of it is setting up the, the foundation as you move into the, the following months. Yeah, absolutely. August is, is uh, kind of the, the month that we use to set the stage for the rest of, of your senior year. And um, it really starts with that college list. Once you have the list defined, it drives everything else because then you know your deadlines and your to-do lists. Um, one tip to make August manageable for parents and students that I like to suggest is sit down as a family and carve out an agreeable time for you to talk about college. I think a healthy amount to talk about college for a student and a parent is probably no more than twice a week. So maybe it's, you know, Wednesdays at 5.30 and Sundays at 3 p.m. And Sundays we'll go get ice cream while we chat about it. And that's the parents one time to get to kind of peek into what's going on. Um, and then it's the student knows that that they won't be put on the spot throughout the rest of the week. I think remembering for you students who are tuning in, like this is your first chance to really prove to your parents that you're an adult and you're ready for college and you're ready to project manage this as well as you possibly can on your own or with the help of your school counselor or an outside counselor, um, keeping your parents in the loop, but really you're the driver. Um, and then parents, it's your chance to let your students do that and to kind of find that middle ground. Um, so once, maybe twice a week, carve out a special time. And if you can keep that cadence through August, September, October, November, December, really the entire senior year, um, I think you will have a much happier household. Well, no, I mean, that's a great point. I, I, I love that. This is their process and, and it's not easy. And it's hard to, to watch your, your son or daughter kind of work, work through a, a pretty big, 
piece. I mean, it used to be a lot easier. I remember when I applied, it was just a Scantron sheet. And so it was so much different what the what our students go through now. But if you lay out the plan, they they can execute it. There, there you're gonna see the maturity in, in your in your child, which will be really, really cool to watch. Absolutely. Um, okay, so then we get to September, which is about two weeks from now. So we would hope to see our students really in that that um, part of per, uh, finalizing their personal statement. So you have come up with your idea, you've worked through some drafts, you maybe have um, one to two trusted editors who are going to look at that draft. A lot of times high schools will have um, the English teacher. So if you're in AP English Lit, for instance, or an English 4 class, this will be an assignment for you to complete your personal statement, to have a peer proofread it and have teacher feedback. So right there, you already have two built-in proofreaders. Maybe show it to one parent and then your um, independent um, your independent college coach, if, if that applies. So finalizing that personal statement, getting feedback, but not from too many people and really relying on trusted um, trusted uh, individuals to, to look at that. This is a very vulnerable piece of writing. Um, we want for students to really find, begin and fine tune their activities list. So the common application allows for students to talk about 10 different, up to 10 different activities that they've been involved with throughout their four years of high school. And you have to write about those activities in 150 characters or fewer. So think like tweets for your activities. Um, and so now is the time to really formulate that. The activities list is how you paint the picture of what you've done with your time um, outside of the classroom. Activities list, once you do it for the Common App, it can apply then, you can use that same activities list for the UC. UC allows you to expand a little bit beyond that 150 characters, up to 350 characters, but still that's you know less than a paragraph. Um, so it's not too much writing, but it is definitely not something to be overlooked because um, this is the way that the colleges get to know you beyond your writing and beyond your numbers, uh, your transcript and your test scores. So working on that activities list, um, starting your other applications. So by now you've hopefully started your common application. Um, now would be, September's a really great time to log in if you're applying to any of the California schools. There's two different systems. There's the UC application, one application for all UC schools. And then there's Cal State Apply, which is one application for all of the Cal State schools. And then there's other college specific applications. For instance, Georgetown, uh, they've always done it. They have their own application. You have to complete a full application just for them. They're not on the common app. And then for anybody applying to uh, schools in the UK, there's an application system called the UCAS. So we would want for you to begin your other applications. Um, some of this can be done while you're sitting watching Netflix. You know, there's demographic information that you can literally just fill out. It's as if you're sitting and filling out a form. Um, and then, of course, you'll want to spend some dedicated time proofing it, making sure that everything's accurate. Um, and I think a lot of times I'll have students start the application. They're not capitalizing it. Their grammar isn't correct. Like you want to put your best foot forward. So really be thoughtful in your responses and um, just make life a little bit easier and, and begin those applications. Um, we want you to start to draft your personal insight questions, which are for the UCs. The UCs ask eight personal insight questions, and then you have to choose to respond to four of those. So if you've done the due diligence of creating an essay doc where you have all of your writing on one central Google doc, um, you should to re recycle responses. So maybe one of your common app schools is going to ask you a really similar question that the UC schools are going to ask, and then you can figure out you know one response for two schools and make life a little bit easier. Um, we want in September for you to check in with your recommenders. Most, if not, I'll say most private schools require at least one teacher recommendation, if not two, and then also a counselor recommendation. So if you have not made plans with your teachers yet to write a letter of recommendation on your behalf, now is the time to do it. As someone who used to work in schools and had a caseload of about 60 seniors and had to write letters of rec for all of them, it's a lot of work and you want to make it as easy as possible on your recommender. So provide a recommender with a resume, give them a brag sheet, send them a paragraph about why you think, you know, you really shined in that um, AP biology class last year. 
try and think ahead on how you can help your recommender out. Um, be organized, give them a list of your colleges and the deadlines, and be sure to really follow whatever uh, advice your school counselor is giving you and follow the rules. Because a lot of times they'll say, okay, you must make an arrangement with your teacher by September 15th. Um, and then I've, I've had it, it's heartbreaking, but I've had students miss those dates. And then, you know, the teachers say, sorry, I have a full plate. I'm already writing 25 letters of rec and I teach five periods a day. Like I, I can't take on anything else. And then what are you going to do? So just make sure that you're proactive, really plan ahead um, with your recommenders. Now is a good time to um, take your college list, which is most likely housed in the Common App and on your essay doc at this point, and make sure that it's accurate and plug it into your school system, whether that's Naviance or SCORE or College Kickstart. And that's how you can ensure that your letter of rec will get where it needs to go. Um, check in with your school counselor constantly. You want to make sure that you're, you're up to speed and following all directions, just as I mentioned before. And your counselor is your resource. Um, so make sure that you're connecting with that person. Now is a great time to really start the drafts of your supplements. So last month, you hopefully outlined a good portion of them. Now is the time to actually put pen to paper and draft them. And then um, a handful of your schools may require or at least recommend that you set up an interview. Um, every school kind of does things differently. Sometimes you actually have to go through and hit submit on an application before you're even allowed to pursue an interview. Other times, like just a couple of days ago, I helped a student get registered at an at um, for an interview at Rice because theirs is already up and running and she knows that's one of her top schools. So interviews kind of, it's a whole separate piece of the puzzle. This would honestly be a really good parent job. Like if you're as a parent wondering, what can you do to help my student? Research like the interview policies for your student's list and then help them navigate that. You should not be the one as the parent registering for the interview, um, but at least you can help, you know, find links and information about interviews for your student. And then of course, if you work with a ESM counselor, we can help do all of that for you as well. I, I love the, one or two trusted editors do not get too many cooks in that kitchen everyone these are subjective like it's really hard for anyone and oftentimes i say it's maybe a parent but usually it's someone outside of of a parent because the parent you're too invested so someone that really can be objective and is good with grammar and those type of things as well but having one or two not too many because too many cooks in the kitchen uh, is really important. And I tell every kid, and Carrie, you know this, like the most important person on that campus for a high school student is their counselor. They are just that important because they handle all of your transcripts. They handle all the different pieces of your application. So making their life easy is priority number one. They'll write you a better letter, letter of recommendation. They're going to write, and if you do Naviant score, whatever those pieces are, send them an email right now. Hey, is there anything you need from me right now? I'm more than happy and I'll get it done by the end of the day. So they know that you're invested in it too. So absolutely, such such a great September. Then we get to October. This is this is usually the, the month of where you'll see a lot of students wait till about October 15th to go, oh, here comes November 1st. And now they're trying to do this whole entire process in those last two weeks, which ultimately will lead to a, a, a pretty poor application. So that's why getting ahead of these things is really, really important. You're going to finalize your and submit your early round applications. So usually that's November 1st. Some of them have an October 15th, like University of South Carolina has an October 15th. Clemson has an October 15th. You don't want to miss those deadlines. It, it does cause you to move into the regular round, which overall is usually better to be applying in the earlier rounds. So finalize that common app, review it. You can print it out. So print it out like a PDF and read through it. Have your parents look through this one. Make sure your name's right. Make sure your address is right. Make sure emails are right. It can be pretty easy when you've looked at this comment app now at least 500 times for you to miss it. So this is something that you can print that PDF and actually look at what the admissions officer is looking at. Does it look like it's formatted right? If you copy and paste in an essay, is it all bold? Common app will do this to you. So check formatting, things like that. Print it out before you submit. And then you will be submitting those early round applications, usually around October 15th for November 1st. I like two weeks ahead of time. Seems about a good amount of time, but overall, just don't mess with the deadlines. I always am panicked about Common App crashing on November 1st. So in the end, apply a week or two early. Set up your portal accounts. This is another trick that ends up happening. After you submit, 
the schools will almost always send you an email saying, hey, create your portal, create your application status page. They name it all something different, but it's where they communicate with you. So we have to set up those portals, put those login and passwords somewhere so you don't forget them and you need to check them all the time. So at least once a week, but if not twice a week, I tell kids Mondays and Fridays, go into each portal and just make sure there's no communication. Maybe they didn't receive something that they needed in that portal is where they're going to tell you and you're able to respond really, really quickly. That's why getting good at email is important. Parents, FAFSA and CSS profile. It's usually about the time that these things open up and you're starting to work on them. And, and overall, most parents are going to work on them. Yes, if you're not going to qualify for need-based aid, you might not need to. CSS profile almost always is for those very selective schools. But oftentimes, sometimes the merit aid can be tied through the FAFSA. So oftentimes, you still need to, to fill it out. So we tell parents, it's not a fun part of the process. It's another. It's a governmental document. But most of the time, it, it's, just, it's just fine for most parents to do it. If you know you're going to full pay regardless, then, then okay, but in general, it, it probably takes a few hours and getting it done can, can often lead to, to having that school not hound you about it and it could be helpful. If your recommenders have, in Common App, you can see if your recommenders have uploaded the letter. When you see that, you need to go thank them and say thank you and in a preferably in person and with a, with a handwritten note because that meant they spent probably about an hour or longer writing that letter to make you shine for admissions. So it's really important that you thank them. It also builds that relationship because these are people that now have written something about you that it's gonna live in your applications forever. So they're really, really important. You're here to see this again, follow up with your counselor. Again, it's making sure that they have what they need to make their life as easy as possible. Cannot stress that enough, how important those school counselors are. Continue testing if needed. So there's October tests. And remember, these October tests can be used for early round applications. So you don't have to only, they're not just for regular round. They, they can be used for your November 1st deadlines, which means that you have usually two shots or this last one here to kind of really bump your score up, up for admissions. Usually by about the middle of October, you should be wrapping up your early round supplements. You're now starting to move on to those regular round supplements. Yes, it seems kind of crazy to work on supplements that are due January 1st applications in October, but you'd want to get ahead of these because in the end, Thanksgiving break, a lot of kids are using for UCI essays instead of being done with them. So now their Thanksgiving break is kind of taken away because they're working on essays. And the same thing happens with winter break where law students are using those winter breaks to write a bunch of essays when if they were just ahead of it, now they can kick back and enjoy both of those moments when oftentimes this might be the last time that you're in that house for those special holidays. It's, 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 I just, that's why we push so hard to be done with things early so that you get to sit back and enjoy those moments and your parents do too, because that's something that's, it, it is a special time. And to know that you're kicked back. I tell kids when you're done and kids don't know certain things, like, I don't know what FERPA means and different ideas. And you know it, you go, cool. Well, let's go to Chipotle. You're buying and I'll tell you all about it because you're way ahead of it and you get a bunch of free lunches. So in the end, the goal is to get ahead of it. And it's hard to write essays when you've submitted, but get ahead of those regular round supplementals. Absolutely. Um, and I think keeping in mind for any early round applications, which as, just as a reminder means early decision or restrictive early action or early action or rolling for those applications, a really good goal is like, um, if it's a November 1st deadline, we're talking like October 15th or maybe a, like a week before Halloween, because the last thing we want is A, to ruin your Halloween, B, for you to be submitting your application, and then all of a sudden the application system crashes. And that has happened before for anybody who waits to that last minute, because thousands of people will be on the common app at the exact same time. And that would just be a really big bummer. So plan ahead. Um, now is your time to become your best project manager you've ever been. So maybe it's getting a whiteboard and putting out every week what you're going to accomplish for that week. Or maybe it's operating via Google Docs or um, good old pen to paper and a notebook. Find your system, stick to it, and then celebrate when you're when you're able to look back and be like, wow, I got my application in. I feel really good about this and have a, you know, a stress-free 
Halloween, and then Thanksgiving for the next round. So really can't stress that enough. Find a system, stick with it, follow through, and you'll be good to go. So November. Um, November is normally pretty UC heavy because the UC application is due November 30th. So again, we'll probably have you strive for really like a November 15th admit would be great. Stress-free Thanksgiving. Um, so in November, you're finalizing your UC PIQs, those personal insight questions. You're submitting the UC and Cal State application. Just as a reminder for anybody applying to California uh, Cal States, there's no essays. So that's really exciting. Um, but the UCs do require essays. Um, we want for you to hopefully get a handle on completing your regular round supplement. This would probably be extra credit in my book if you can get to that point in November. But remember, this is your time to shine. And, and I have faith you guys can get there. Um, now is the time to actually start um, developing and thinking about what's called a continued interest letter. So we have to plan ahead a little bit in the event you apply to, let's say you apply somewhere um, early decision, and then you are deferred. They say, you know what? We're not quite ready to make a decision on you. We're going to actually bump you into the regular pool, meaning you're not going to get a decision from us until probably February or March. And we want to make sure that we can actually see your fall grades um, and find out what you've been up to between the time that you submitted your application in early November up until when they'll make their decision, which will be in February-ish. So it's important for students to continue to develop their resume, um, really. I'm not saying you need to you know, go and take on a bunch of new activities, but continue your activities and try and go a little bit deeper within those activities. And then if there's a natural way for you to take on maybe one new thing, go for it because you're gonna need content. Um, you're going to need something to talk about, something that's compelling to tell um, your colleges about what you're doing. You know, this might not apply to everybody. Most of our students hopefully will be getting into all of their early actions, early decisions, and then we don't have to worry about a continued interest letter. But I just like Eric and I, as we were formulating this uh, point, we thought we need to just make you aware that this could be something down the line. So November would be an important time to just sort of check in with yourself, think about what you're doing and think about um, potentially adding something to your resume. Um, and, and with that, the activity list um, and for further developing that. And then November is also the time to really make sure your interview plans are, are locked and that you're following through, showing up to those interviews. Um, we could probably do a whole webinar on interviews, but you know, same rules apply as you, with your recommenders. Try and write thank you notes. Um, be yourself. Um, there's lots that goes into those interviews, but definitely like the mechanics of it. Make sure that you know which schools you need to pursue interviews for pursue them and follow through. Yeah, I, th that continued interest letter, so many kids do get deferred or waitlisted. And oftentimes when you're updating, they're like, wow, well, I haven't done anything new. And most most students are like, I, I, I got good grades. I kept my grades up, but there really wasn't anything else out there. And that's where you trying to write that letter and looking like you are doing something new, but you're not can be really difficult. So that's where just going and grabbing something that is, of course, good timing for UPS to knock on my door. Um, but overall, it's really about finding one new thing. You don't need a lot. Just one new thing that can be added to that letter. And it makes things so much easier when you are writing that letter. So, I, it, and it's so hard to do for students. They just went through the process. They just submitted a bunch of stuff. They probably just submitted UCs. Uh, oh, wait, we got to do this. And so it can be sometimes a little difficult um, to kind of then go, oh, let me focus on this because you're usually pretty tired by this point. So it just, it makes your life so much easier when you're writing this letter in January. Which kind of takes us through that December through February timeframe, a little bit longer. So if you're accepted early decision, usually that's around December 15th, that second week, some schools it's a little later, some schools a little earlier. You just have to pay attention to their Twitter accounts or their websites when they're releasing their decisions. If you are accepted early decision, follow the instructions of that school. They're very different. Some schools require you to rescind applications in 72 hours, a week. Some say, no, you don't have to rescind until September 1st. Some are just, you need to put in your deposit. 
follow the outline instructions, what you have to do if you're accepted early decision. Remember, early decision is the binding uh, uh, application. So if you're accepted early decision, follow what that school says. You don't want to have anything happen because you didn't do something right. Now you have a lot, usually December 15th, you have some different outcomes. So now you can re-strategize your college list. Let's say you didn't get in early decision and you were deferred or waitlisted or rejected. Well, a lot of schools have early decision too. So that's an early decision program, but it's January 1st or that first week, whenever their, their deadline is for their regular decision, which gives you kind of a second chance at an early decision, which schools really lean on that early decision program. I mean, Tulane showed this year that 100 kids got in regular decision. So how many kids were early decision? Basically, they're almost their entire class. So it's really important. If you don't get in the first one, you now have a second chance and early decision to school. So it's re-strategizing that college list. Now let's say you, you, you didn't apply early decision anywhere and you got into an early action you're really, really happy about. Cool. Overall, now are you going to apply to those regular decision schools? So some of those schools that are January 1st, you're not really submitting until after December 15th or kind of when you've heard back from these schools. Because why pay for an application if you're actually not going to go? So that's something to kind of re-strategize. Maybe if you got into your dream school already, we don't need to send those regular decision applications. Now, don't use that as an excuse to wait on writing those essays, because then your essays will be very poor for usually the most difficult or more selective schools to get in, which is a regular decision. So keep working on those in October, and November. But overall, your college list might move around a little bit because of where you were accepted, deferred, or, or waitlisted. That's where you finalize the submitting your regular decision applications. Usually this is after you've kind of heard from those early round schools that have released and, and get, make sure you get those in. Don't wait to the deadlines. Again, you have millions of kids that are applying. So last thing you wanna do is wait for a January 1st deadline and common out crashes. And now you're worried, are they gonna give you an extension and all? It's just not worth the stress, apply early and you will, you'll have new issues. Now work on and send continued interest letters. This is usually following in that kind of January time. You get back from, from winter break, you're now starting to look on what schools you were deferred, what schools were waitlisted, and, and now you're starting to work on those continued interest letters that you had already been setting up since November of a new activity you get to write about. The most common question I get from seniors is how important are my grades? Very important. Every school can, if you're deferred, will be looking at your seventh semester grades. Regular decision schools will be looking at your seventh semester grades. So it is vital to keep those grades up. When you're writing your continued interest letter, the last thing you want to say is, yeah, my grades dropped from a 4.0 to a 3.5. Because they're going to ask, it asks, like, you need to update. I kept my 4.4. I kept my 3.8. You really want to make sure that you're keeping your grades up, even when it's kind of the most difficult, because you've come out of the most difficult season of, of your high school career when you're juggling all these different things. But keeping those grades up is vital. It's also important to hold on to your classes. I get a lot of questions. What if I drop this class? What if I drop that class? Especially after you've submitted, if a school hasn't given you a decision and you've changed your classes, you now have to update them. And now you're updating them usually because you've backed off on a rigor or dropped a class. Oftentimes now you're saying, yeah, sorry, I didn't want to take that class. And I don't think it's the best look for an admissions officer to read. Oh, why did they just continue with that? And, and overall, keep, keep your classes, grades up, and, and work hard. You won't get to relax and enjoy the ride a little bit, especially when you get to kind of late January. You've put in your continued interest letters. You're kind of in a, that middle zone where you're not getting a lot of uh, responses. Some schools will come out in February, but generally you kind of have that December and you have March. Those are the main areas. Yes, some will trickle out in February, but overall, you get to kind of enjoy being a senior. It's a very special time for you as a high schooler. So you get to en enjoy those moments and you should relax a little bit because you have worked so hard to get these things done ahead of time. Totally. And, and I think um, one thing to mention is it can be really hard in December, especially as you start to see friends and peers and hearing about who got in where. So I just really encourage you as families to um, keep a level head, try not to do the comparison game. And just know that this, this process, if you've done the initial work of really developing a college list that matches with who you are, like you're going to end up where you're meant to go. Um, and it just has a way of, of working out. Um, but keep your head up and it can, there's highs and lows throughout this whole process. And so um, I implore you to really try not to compare yourself to your peers because 
that can be a really difficult part of this whole thing. Okay, so as those offer letters roll in, um, March through May is really the time to kind of compare. Maybe even if you're able to go visit a campus and really get a feel for what which school is going to be the best option for you. Um, you have to accept an offer of admission by May 1st. Um, so that means you're depositing at a school, signing up for housing, um, and all of that has to be done by May 1st, if not sooner. So really, um, we want you to, to kind of talk to your counselor, talk to anyone who attends any school that you're interested in going to, to really know all the facts and make the best and most informed decision for yourself. Um, but March through May is, is research and then committing um, and really hopefully enjoying the rest of your senior year and celebrating all your accomplishments and your hard work um, because it goes by fast and you really only get that spring of senior year once. So we want you to have fun, but we also want you to stay out of trouble, keep your grades up and make the best and most informed decision. No trouble. That's a good one. Yeah, because you don't want to have to update any uh, colleges that you're accepted at. Sorry, now this has happened. Um, so okay. yeah, really, really being smart with with the uh, with enjoying senior year. I think that's a great point, Carrie. Absolutely. All right. Well, some final thoughts for you. Start with a big inhale, exhale. Yeah. <laughs> it's gonna be a crazy two and a half, three months. There's there's no way to get around that. Um, but I think you know, knowing that these next 10 weeks, super, super critical, um, treating it like a class, I think is a really good way to look at it. You have homework every single night for some of your classes. You have college counseling homework. You probably should be doing almost every single night. I really like Eric's 15 minutes a day. Honestly, that would probably get you pretty far. Um, maybe, or 15 minutes a day and then carving out like a two hour block each weekend, um, should get you decently far through this process. Um, yep, and breaking it up piece by piece, really manageable to do that. Um, if you just are an effective project manager, find your system. Yeah, yeah. It, it's it's so hard, but it, it it really is important to lay out what you need to do week to week. I think eating that elephant one bite at a time is really important. And instead of looking at the whole thing, breaking it into small pieces, this is a, it's a skill that is used in the workforce. It's what we do every day is taking this process and bringing them into pieces. Um, this third point, read your essays out loud. You should be doing this already with every essay you write. It's really hard, but it, what it really helps you with is sentence variance. So it's not just short sentence, short sentence, short sentence, short sentence. It helps you really understand, because reading, you say it's a conversation in your head. It's not just reading it. And so it really is about the cadence of your sentences. When you read it out loud, like, oh, I don't like that. That didn't sound very good. And now you can rewrite it like, oh, this sounds so much better. Read those essays out loud. I know it's uncomfortable. No one likes to hear it, but it really does make a big difference. Definitely. Um, doing a reverse admission analysis. I like students to do this kind of at the beginning of the process. And then again, at the end to get a temperature gauge of if you effectively communicated all the points that you wanted to. So to start thinking about what are the main things, if you were to sit down with an admission officer at your dream school, what are those five things that you want that person to understand about who you are as a person and who you are as a student? And then working your application backwards and making sure that those points shine through. Um, so doing that at the beginning and then again at the end before you hit submit can be really helpful just to be thorough. Yeah. And then we already, already touched on the yeah, comparing your, said, your process to your it's peers. So it's, this is so hard for families, for, for students, is you see what other kids maybe got into a school, like how did they get in? In the end, there's so much of this process that you don't know. Did another kid with a better GPA and test scores apply to the same major to the same school? There's things that are out of your, out of your like maybe the, the Sacramento region just had 15 more kids apply to this one school than over the previous year. And it just kind of knocked your student. There's so much out of control that the student and the parents don't can't, they're just, we don't have control over it. You don't, and sometimes that adjusts outcomes in a, in a, what's quote, quote, a negative way. When in reality, if the kid leaves this process with no regrets, they've done everything they could. And I think that's the piece of the puzzle I focus on with my students. Is that's really our only goal. If you leave high school with no regrets, you've done everything you could. The chips will fall the way they fall. 
and overwhelmingly it works out for each and every student that are at the school they adore and love and have the time of their life and i call it they get to go to fun school versus high school which is so much more dictated now they get to kind of really focus in on what they love doing and and it's it's so worth it uh so but it's so hard to not compare and it really isn't about what everyone else is doing it really is about what you and what your student needs and wants absolutely and last but not least um this is sort of a an overview a pdf overview of pretty much everything that we talked about so um you can actually access this on our website um if you if you feel so inclined you could download it put it on the fridge have it be a nice guide for the family um but this is really meant to be a resource for you to keep you on track um and please reach out reach out if you have questions along the way we're here to help you and support you through this um and that's that's all I've got. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. If you guys have any questions, send us a send us a note. Best ways contact us through through esm.com, esmprep.com. And um, we uh, hopefully this was helpful. And uh, overall, thank you, Carrie, for for everything. Um, you just you're just brilliant. You make you make this process look easy, and it and we know it's not. So not could not appreciate what what you do for us with ESM and your knowledge that you expand upon us that have not had inside the high school experience it's been uh, it's been really cool to to be a part of this one cuz i've learned so much well thanks eric same to you best of luck these next 10 weeks us adults need that too and um For sure. everybody who's tuned in we really appreciate your time take care Great. thanks carrie bye everyone